Well, thank you for joining another segment of Chevy's Corner. Today, I have the honor and privilege of interviewing Graciano Rubio, uh, owner of CrossFit Valley View, strongman competitor and Olympic weightlifting athlete in training. This man's a beast. If you haven't seen him on Instagram, where, is, where I found him, uh, through my reels, I was actually just watching through, scrolling by. And I saw this man um, hitting a 330 Isabel uh, for 19 minutes and 58 seconds. Uh, if you don't know what Isabel is, Isabel is basically hitting a bunch of snatches in a very short amount of time. I don't even know how many snatches it is. Uh, guide me here. How many snatches did you do with 330? 30 of them. 30. 30 snatches with 330 pounds. And 330 pounds is about... I don't know, 150, 150 kilos, 30 snatches in 20 minutes. This man's a freak of nature, uh, hasn't competed yet in Olympic weightlifting. So he's a hidden gem that nobody knows about. So I'm trying to shed some light on this man's journey, shed some light on this man's uh, awesomeness. And I'm going to pass on the mic to him so he can introduce himself and, and tell you guys what he's all about. Graciano? Hey, I'm, uh, Go ahead. Graciano Rubio. Uh, I was born in Salem, Oregon. Grew up there for the uh, first 18 years of my life. Uh, I attended Oregon State University, got a degree in economics, uh, moved to California in 2012. I've uh, started, well, I started dating the gym owner at the time. That's how I became a uh, Owner of CrossFit Valley View. We're married. We got two kids now. Um, nine years later, I'm 30. Uh, pro strongman competitor since I was uh, 23. Uh, grew up idolizing all the guys on World Strongest Man. So from the time I was a little kid, you know, started off with pro wrestling. Then it started off to watching World Strongest Man on um, on TV. And I wanted to be like those guys. And so that was my original goal getting into weightlifting or getting into just lifting in general was, you know, I'd always dream that, you know, I would be one of those guys, you know, hitting the stones, hitting, hitting big log for reps, hitting all that stuff. So, you know, I wanted to be like that. And then <clears throat> that's kind of what had, what continued my journey of lifting, you know, until I became a pro strongman. Then the kind of the focus was career, kids, other stuff. So I started weightlifting kind of as a hobby. Um, it's a, since it's a very technical sport, there's a, you never leave the gym being like, hey, I did it. That was perfect. That was great. So I, I took up weightlifting because it's, um, it's a little easier on the joints than some of the other movements of strongman. So it's, it's a good mental challenge. You can develop your speed. You develop a lot of different qualities that you can't get out of strongman. So that's how I started. And then it was, it was so much fun that I just, I've continued doing it ever since. So I've been kind of dabbling in weightlifting for about six years now. Um, and, you know, my goals have changed over time. They've mostly been just to be as strong as possible. I've always had kind of shorter term goals. And so right now it's just, um, well, I'll get, I'll jump back. When I first started lifting, you know, I wanted to get better at football. So went into the gym, my brother could bench press 315. And so right when I hit the gym as a freshman, my single goal I focused all the time is I wanted to beat my brother. My brother is 11 years older than me. And so he showed me what I could do. You know, he's got the same genetics. I got access to more information when I, I wanted to beat him. And it wasn't a question of if I could, it was just when. You know, do the work. I know that's possible. So I did it. Then those goals kind of shifted over time. We got into, into strongman training. Um, the guy that I trained perhaps the closest with, and most of my training was, was solo, was a guy named Chris Roth. Okay. And Chris Roth was an absolute freak strongman competitor. Uh, this guy was lighter than everybody. He was faster. He was more explosive. Um, and that that's because he had a weightlifting background. 
So that was kind of my first introduction to how weightlifting improves your performance in strongman because he would get his reps done faster. And when you're doing something for reps, you know, you, you got a minute to do them. If you can do them faster, you have a better shot of getting more reps. So that was kind of, you know, besides the movements look cool. That was my first introduction of, hey, you know, weightlifting can really improve your strongman performance. So I added a few movements in here and there. Um, I started doing CrossFit and then the weightlifting took off from there. You know, as soon as I was done with strongman, it was like, all right, let's, let's figure out how to do these things. Then it kind of got, you know, different goals, different motivations. Um, but that's led me to today where, you know, my main goal, I would say, is I want to do for my son what my brother did for me. Because when I grew up, he showed me, hey, this is what you can do. So when I came into the gym, it was like, oh, I'm going to do a 315 bench. Okay. I know it. I know that's possible. I'm going to get there. So now when I train, you know, I'm looking at what is my son going to grow up and think, hey, what, what is the standard? What do I know I can do? Because my dad showed me this is possible. So that's, that's kind of what, what gets me in the gym or what kind of when it sucks, you know, and you're kind of pushing through the workout, you know, it's kind of going full circle back to, I want him to grow up saying, Hey, I know I can do these things because my dad showed me I could do it. Well, um, so that's, that's it about me. That's it. That's so my background. Interviews that's, done? that's where's <laughs> it? We're Dover. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your training and, you know, in regards to, in regards to what you just mentioned about guiding your son through the right through the right path to what you understand is meaningful for a man to become into a man right mm -hmm. um i'm pretty sure that not only your son but the people that surround you and your athletes they all they're all taking some of that within themselves as well right because you're not only training to be a badass you're i'm pretty sure you coach people to be badass too right because you're a gym owner crossfit and uh, I'm pretty sure that you teach them all these other stuff too. So, you know, there's something to, to look within yourself and, and continue to expand that knowledge is always good because you're able to spread that positivity and growth to the people that surround you. Absolutely. Um, so the other thing, so I own a gym, you know, part of the motivation of coaching other people is that, so when I was 16, my sister passed away. And my sister died from obesity. Okay. So she was 26. I was 16. So as I kind of got, I got a little bit older, I started coaching other people. You know, I live in a, I live in a county where at one point, I don't know if this stat is current, but a couple of years ago, they had the highest rates of childhood obesity. You know, wow. at one time I was about 50 pounds heavier. So part of, part of coaching, part of passing that on to the people around me, is helping other people learn how to live a healthier lifestyle, you know, how to improve their diet, how do they exercise and, and, and increase their health, not just through pharmaceutical means, but through methods that they have that are empowering, you know, what they can do with their, with their own actions to improve, not purely, you know, relying on other people to, to prescribe something that is going to help them out. Yeah. So there, we have some people that, you know, their goal is performance. And I try to stay at the front of that. So when they, when they come in and they do their best, they move on right away. Hey, this guy, I know that, that I can lift more weight because this guy's lifting more weight. Yeah. You know, it keeps them moving. Mm -hmm. Some of our other athletes, their goal is not performance. Their goal is health. And I want them to look at and say, hey, this is, what, this is how they live. You know, they cook their food ahead of time. They do these other healthy habits. You know, I know that it's possible to have a family do these things and still live healthy because they're showing me that I can do it. So we, we do a lot of coaching. We do nutrition coaching, um, lift different personal training, obviously CrossFit classes. But we're trying to deliver to our community the overall lifestyle, you know, lifting well, 
moving well, feeling good, being healthy. Uh, that's what I'm trying to pass on, you know, to everybody around me. Awesome, man. And I'm, and that, that, that's really good to hear because honestly, like prioritizing the health of your clients is one of the most important things that any coach can truly develop. When you are pushing your athlete to be in a uncomfortable position, you know, it's only like you need to do these amount of reps without really addressing other aspects of their life that also need to be taken care of. You know, like you mentioned, um, nutrition, rest, all these other aspects that go into a successful lift, stretching up, warming up, all that good stuff. All of these play part of the overall grand scheme that goes into play when you are trying to be successful. Uh, you have to put in a plan into play. You have to figure out what is what is the roadmap that I'm going to follow. And it seems like you got a pretty good method for yourself going on. Do you want to talk about your method? Yeah, there's a couple so far. Yeah. For, for our gym, you know, we do this athletic level ranking program. Okay. And we take people through seven different levels of a balanced CrossFit performance between weightlifting, gymnastics, conditioning. So when you show up to the gym, you have a handful of different metrics you need to hit. I think we start off at 16 different things. Yeah. Then you progress all the way from our first rank of CrossFitter our last drink is a fire breather. So we show people this is, this is how your performance will evolve over time. So this, as soon as you kind of fall off in one area, we know, hey, we need to address this. You know, we're not quite getting this down or we're not getting that down. We need to add some more to it. Or, hey, why, you know, what's holding you back? Is it the nutrition? Is it the lack of sleep? Is it the stress? What, what is it that it's going to take you to get there? Because, we have those seven levels of performance and we incorporate that with CrossFit's sickness, wellness, and fitness continuum. Yeah. Essentially, you know, CrossFit put out this continuum that the fitter you are, the healthier you are, which holds to a certain point. Obviously at the, at the far end, you're talking the best in the world. You're pushing your body to a certain point. You know, we focus on the anomalies. You know, the guy going for the world's fastest mile or heaviest lift. But for the most part, you perform better, your body's healthier. You know, higher work capacity is going to lead to better health. So we get people involved where we try to get them to see the full picture yeah. that you're really working on the same quality no matter what you're doing. If you're trying to improve in this area, it's going to improve your health. If, you're, if your cardiovascular conditioning is better, you're going to be better off. If your strength is better, you're going to be better off. And so we, that is how we treat our, our, I would say, our average client goes through that of seeing here's what you're doing in the gym. Here's how it correlates to outside of the gym in terms of your health and the quality of life you're going to be able to live because of that. On the performance side, we break away a little bit. And that's where I have, you know, what I've deemed the 50 to one method. So people will know the 50 to one principle. If you've read um, Nassim Taleb's Incerto series, it's a series of four books. And in there, he brings up the Pareto principle, you know, the 80-20 rule, which most people in management have heard at some point. And it is... 80% of your results are from 20% of what you do. And we kind of throw that out there as a general idea. And people don't really push back or expand on that. So for your, for your avid CrossFitter or a lot of strength enthusiasts, I'm going to use some simple, you know, time frames so that they understand it a little bit. You know, if you're at the gym for 100 minutes, you know, an hour 40, mm -hmm. you know, 80% of your results come from about 20% of what you do. And that's a, that's a reasonable estimate, you know. You need to warm up. You need to stretch. You need to go through your warm-ups. You need to do a lot of those things. 
You got to do your cool down. You got to do your skill work, but it's really the lifting and the wad that are going to get your results. So that's 20 minutes of that entire hour 40 that you're at the gym. That's most of your results, the hard stuff. So it's necessary to do all that extra work, but at the end of the day, you actually got to work hard and push your limits to get better. Well, if we take those 20 minutes explain and we that, explain that, rules, you know, for someone that doesn't understand that well, that those extra <laughs> 20 minutes of hard work are the ones that push through, you know, and help out to that next level. Cause you gave me an example earlier before the interview that after you explained it, I understood it really well. And you mentioned, um, you know, that, 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 that teenager kind of kid that comes in and is tired and they don't really understand the importance of those reps. And when you explain that, that way that you explained to me earlier, they got it right. So you were talking about like a 10 rep scheme and they don't want to do a 10. Yeah. They want to do eight, all that good stuff. So you want to do it, go through that example again. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to add a little bit to that. Okay. You know, we, you know, we think of our workouts. A lot of times you get trapped into this idea of thinking of your workouts, like building a brick wall, you know, every yeah. workout I do or every rep I do, we're putting a brick. So if I go to the gym and I do some bench press, I'm adding a brick. I'm going to add a brick. I'm going to add a brick. But the body doesn't work like that. The body's adapted to a certain lifestyle, a certain level of performance. And it's only when you push beyond what it's currently adapted to do you get better. We think, hey, if I come in and every day I walk a mile, you're good at walking a mile. That's not going to improve your fitness. It'll maintain it. But it's not going to improve it once you've adapted to that already. So the eight that um, print, the idea that I gave you was one thing that we do is I focus very heavily on the one rep max formulas. So they've had a couple different studies where they, they look at, you know, top athletes and track, you know, what percentage of your max can you do for five reps? And the numbers are slightly off, but I think the consensus is usually like your five rep max is roughly 85%. Or the one that I use the most often is your 10 rep max is 75% of your best. So if you're a three, if you want to squat 300 pounds, or if you can squat 300 pounds, you should be able to do 225 for 10. You know, approximately. Yeah. Some people are more explosive. Some people have better endurance. But that, that, that relationship is going to hold for most athletes over time. Mm -hmm. You take someone that's naturally super explosive, they can't do as many reps. Someone has great endurance, they'll do more reps than the formula suggests. It's really not important that they can or can't do 300 if they do 225 for 10. What's important is they have an objective measurement of how hard that set was. Okay. So... If I do 225 for 10 and then I do, you know, 285 for nine, we know that 285 for nine was way harder. Yeah. There's no, com there's no comparison there. Like that is so much harder that it, no, you can't compare the two. Like that's obvious. But when we get kind of to the smaller differences, we don't have a good way to compare like 225 for 10 versus let's say 245 for seven. We don't really know. So using that formula gives us a, a good objective measurement. That's how hard that was. So when we use it with, with athletes, there's an idea that I coined. I just said, you're going to move the carrot closer. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of times, we view motivation as something that people have, not something that people do. Okay. Which I, I think is... is I think is wrong. You know, you have to find ways to motivate yourself. You have to find mm -hmm. ways to get yourself going. Yeah. The best athletes, it's not that they have more motivation. They're better at motivating themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and that's really good that you say that because I've been dabbling with that reality right lately. Um, as an individual that have been training for 10 years, I know that you've been training for a long years. There's this common theme or 
approach to training for a long period of time and it's do the work even when you don't want it right even though you don't want to you don't feel like you don't feel like going to train like just still get it done but once you're there if you don't feel like doing it you're not going to get the maximum results and i think that like you just said finding a way is to motivate yourself even when you're not feeling in the mood and you're already getting through the war you're already getting through the warm-up you know that that moment of having to grab that bar for the first time is about to come close. You're finishing out your warm up. Your body feels completely trashed from the previous day of work. The doms are starting to hit, yeah. You know? And you're like, I don't, I don't want to do a snatch today. I don't want to clean today. On your case, you're doing many snatches at a very high weight. So like to even warm up to that, and then think, all right, I'm gonna do 30 snatches at this weight. I mean, I can't even imagine the stressful react like coming to realize damn this is heavy and i'm gonna have to snatch it 30 times and i'm gonna have to do it really fast and really technically i mean just mentally approaching 330 for me it's 150 kilos doing it for one it, i'm dreading on it all week I'm, I'm thinking about that 330 all week i can't even imagine you thinking about doing it 30 times in 20 minutes and you're just coming up to the gym and you're just like finding ways to motivate yourself, not only for that one rep, but for 29 more. Tell me about that. Where does that motivation come from? Because it's clear that your mental game is on point. It's clear that your mental game is on point. There, 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 is, no, there is no doubt in my mind that you have a very strong mental game, especially if you're able to lift that much amount of weight you haven't competed yet. You're just doing this for yourself. You're just doing it because you enjoy it. You're, you're dabbling with the sport. You, you really are exploring different types of training for yourself or, or, and, 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 and you're enjoying the experience of snatching and cleaning and all this stuff. Where do you develop your own mental strength? Because for a guy that doesn't compete in Olympic weightlifting and is doing the things that you're doing at the level that you're doing it, there must be something that you have figured out that maybe someone else doesn't. And I'd like you to share that little, any. So this is, this all comes down to this very, very basic principle of understanding things as like a projected max. It all comes down to the exact same thing. So in that, if you heard, if you watched the last dance, you heard Michael Jordan talk about, you know, things became personal. Yeah. You know, like that was, that's the death blow. Like he feels like he wronged them. It's over. It's over. He gets to that next level that he has to get to. And then some of those guys come back and say, that never happened. That, he made that story up. So he would make up stories about these guys disrespecting him or, or sliding him in some way because he would need to do that to get into that mind space to come crush the guy and drop 50 points on him yeah. and take over the game. So... That's what top athletes do. They find a way, whatever it is, to push themselves. For him, it was making up, even if it didn't happen, either looking for the slightest thing or just totally making up a story that this guy wronged him and he has to come, he has to come seek revenge. Now, that idea that I said, you know, you're going to move the carrot closer. One, you know, that athlete, that's, that's going to do 225 for 10. You're putting right in front of their face, you know, you write out the reps. You know, you want to be a 280-pound squatter or you want to be a 300-pound squatter? Because how you perform right now determines what kind of a squatter you are. You're a 280 squatter or a 300 squatter? Well, you do eight reps, you're a 280 squatter. You do 10 reps, you're a 300 squatter. So that makes it tangible. When you see a program written out that's six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, and you're going to do all this work, up until this point of saying, all right, I'm going to go for a new max 12 weeks from now, you kind of lose track of how the work you do gets you to that new max. But if we're only focusing on the little tiny bit where we're going beyond our limits, it puts it right in front of you every session or every week to say, you want to be a 300 pound squatter, you're going to do 225 for 10. And next week, you want to be a 301 squatter? You want to get stronger? You're going to have to do, I don't know what the numbers are. You're going to have to do 235 for nine. That's it. 
that's harder than 225 for 10. So each session you come in, you see how that session is going to make you stronger. So because you see it and it's an easy, once you take a little time and, and kind of internalize it, you see that develop of like, oh, I'm either going to get stronger and do my reps or I'm not. I'm just not going to get stronger. So during that set, let's say you have your set of 10. The first five reps aren't that hard. You know, I mean, they're tough, but they're not that bad. It's those five, you know, reps, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10, that you understand internally. These are the reps getting me better. These are the reps that are making me stronger. And you create on yourself this high pressure situation. Of I either do those extra five reps, I get that full set of 10 and get stronger, or I get nine, and I'm not going to get stronger. Nine's not harder than what I, what I was doing a week ago. Nine, not getting better. 10, I'm getting better. So when you create that make or break situation, you develop that skill of pushing your body to the limit of I got my 10. Now, when you're a young athlete, you do that week after week after week, all these sessions in a, in a linear format, you go from squatting, let's say 200 pounds, and in two years you're squatting 300 pounds, you do that over the course of two years, say from age 14 to 16. That's a hundred times. That's a hundred times that you created this high pressure situation that you push yourself to the limit. And then you build that self-belief of, hey, if I, if I say I'm getting those reps, I'm getting them over and over and over again. After a hundred times of proving to yourself that, hey, when I say I'm doing this set, I get it done. You develop that self-belief. And you push yourself to a far higher level than coming in and writing out this 12-week program of all these sets of reps that you don't really know what they mean, trying for a max. Maybe you get it, maybe you don't. You don't have enough of those high-pressure situations where you can stress yourself and it's make or break. So that's the exercise science part of it. People are going to be like, that's the dumbest method ever. But the mental aspect of constantly proving to yourself, hey, I said I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the hardest set of squats I've ever done in my life. And then you do it. And you do it 100 times. And you go from being squatting 200 pounds to squatting 300 pounds. Now this 300-pound squatter, yeah, it's cool. They're stronger. But mentally, they're sharp. Mentally, they're tough. They believe in themselves. They say, hey, when I say I'm going to get this set, I'm going to get it. I'm going to push my body there. And so that's where that's developed. That's the difference, you know, that's how I trained for, you know, nine years from age 14 to 23 to be a pro strongman. You know, the reason I, when I get into competition, you know, for strongman, I don't just totally blink and make a bunch of mistakes and forget what I'm supposed to do. It's because I've recreated that situation thousands of times. You know, I've practiced being here Nine reps is the event win, eight wins, I lose. You're going to come into that moment, at strongman's five events. On your fifth event, you're going to get into a situation where you're the, let's say you're the leader. You get to go last. And to win, you need nine reps, eight reps, you lose. I've practiced that so many times in the gym, getting my body worked up, my mind worked up to that point to say, I need nine to win. I got to get nine. Eight's a loss. Eight, eight, I, I'm second place. Nine reps, I'm first place. I can push and get everything I can out of my body because mentally I've practiced that situation so many times. And some athletes just wanted a little more. We see, we see that all the time. This guy just wanted it more. So that's the that's where kind of that resilience comes from is that that style of training of getting hyper-focused only on the reps that really are hard, that are beyond what you're currently able to do and seeing those all the time. Yes. All the other stuff you do in the gym matters, but getting really focused on those points where you're going beyond your current limits, you build your mental toughness there. So, and something like Isabel, you know, those 30 snatches, 
The first five, I'm not even thinking about. In fact, if you, because people are, people are going to bring up the music that I listen to, I'm going to add, I'm going to add another aspect of psychology to it. You know, let's break what, down. What music were you listening to in that, in that, that day? Oh man. Some of the greatest selling artists of all time. Uh, so one? I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that enjoys it. I think Mariah Carey starts off. Mariah Carey. Selena. Selena, the greatest artist of all time. Um, let me specify the greatest female artist of all time. And people don't realize that it's for a reason. Okay. I, I don't realize it either, my dude. Tell me what's the reason. So a snatch takes four seconds, roughly, to actually perform the lift. So in those 20 minutes, I'm only doing two minutes of actual lifting. I'm doing 18 minutes of either resting or getting ready to lift. But there's only two minutes of lifting. Now, of the four seconds of the snatch, only two seconds are really hard. The first phase of the lift, you know, the first second, not easy. But that's not the hard part. The last second is not the hard part. It's everything in the middle that's hard. All that stuff going on in the middle that's hard. So in 20 minutes, I got two minutes of actual lifting. I got one minute of actual hard, this is really tough. And on top of that, of those 30 reps, it's not the first, it's not, you know, the first reps that are tough. It's the second half of the workout that, you know, from rep like 10 to 25 is the brutal part. Those 15 reps. So I really got like 30 seconds that are extremely difficult in those entire 20 minutes. 18 of it's, it's easy to set up and it's easy to sit. So how many snatches did you miss on that zero. 330? Zero. You didn't miss a single snatch. No. You made 30 snatches in a row with 150 kilos. Yeah. So if we go into, um, if you follow James Clear, he's the guy that wrote Atomic Habits. Okay. A lot of people take their, you know, like you, you, when you go to eat food and you smell it, your mouth starts to salivate. You know, you have that, you have that response built in. Yeah. So if you're, if you're adrenaline release and you're getting fired up because you're listening to some specific guitar riff of a song, or you need your training partner to slap you around or yell at you or any of that, if that's your cue to get fired up, you can't get into the mental state to hit all those reps in a row without missing. Because you are so amped up for so long, you tire out. You won't make it 30 reps. You'll be burnt out. If you're running around thinking you have to take 12 scoops of pre-workout and and turn the music full blast. 20 minutes is a long time to be that amped up. Two minutes isn't very hard. And you got to be, you know, you should be fired up a little bit before. So three minutes. So if your cue is, I need this portion, I need my favorite song on, or I need my training partner, I need this. You're fired up for too long. And by the time you get to like five or six reps, you're mentally, it's too much. You know, you're breaking down. You've given, you've given so much energy on those lifts that your workout's over. You can't sustain that. So if you take your cue something else, you know, whatever you're, motivates you. You were saying you, that this is, this is from a study that you read? No, this is, from, this, is, this is from the book Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. It's okay. called, um, I don't know if it's not habit stacking. He's got a specific thing for it. But if you want to develop a good habit, you tie it into a certain cue, you know, like, you know, you leave the house, you check your phone, you check your wallet, you make sure you got your keys. Yeah. You know, every time you, every time you, before you close the door, you know, clo going, grabbing the doorknob is your cue. Like, oh, my phone, my wallet, my keys, whatever it is, that's your cue that, hey, I'm leaving the house, I need to do this. Yeah. If instead of relying on, on something else external and making that cue 
that adrenaline that adrenaline release that, that you're gonna go for the lift, if you make that something else, um it could be it could be as simple as the way you set your feet on the platform. Like, hey, when I put my foot here, it's time to go. I go through a checklist. So the setup's the same way every time. Set the foot, set the hand, same setup. You're not doing like 12, you're not shifting and doing all kinds of stuff. That's your cue that you're mentally engaged, ready to go. That's what dials in to, so that you're tight on your technique. Yeah. And you can focus for the four seconds you got to do the snatch. And once that bar's out of your hands, all right, everything that just happened, move on. I'm gonna bring myself, I'm gonna bring myself down a little bit, you know, clear my head, wait, then I go through that same cue again. So I'm only, you know, I don't need to be fired up for 20 minutes. I really only got to be fired up for three minutes. The two seconds right before I lift, the four seconds of the snatch, move on. And we often wait, we put our favorite song on, we get all amped up, we do one rep, we maybe get a second rep. By like rep five, that song's over. Like, what do I do now? Like I already hit my peak mentally. So that's, it, it, you have to regulate, you have to regulate that feeling. Okay. If you can't regulate it, you burn out early on. See, what you're talking about happens to me on my heavy, on my heavy uh, squat days where I have to do multiple reps. I don't normally do reps of 10 or fives or stuff like that in our programming. Um, we normally do threes, you know, bottom, down sets of twos, and we work up to single high rep uh, maxes on the front squat or on the back squat, depending on the cycle. Right now, we're in, in, in we are in a accumulation cycle, so we're doing more fives throughout the week, uh, getting more sets of three on the snatch, more sets of three on the cleans. But to relate to what you're saying. Um, for my back squats, I, 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 I've had to focus on what you're saying and my, and I internalize it. And with my positional awareness, like I'm constantly just thinking about my chest, feeling the back, you know, feeling that balance throughout my midfoot, bracing well my core. And as I'm descending, I'm just really focusing on the positions. And it gets to the point where I zone out completely. Like I don't listen to anybody. I don't listen to the music. I'm just literally just thinking about the movement. And I guess what you're saying about that cue, like this is the moment to fire up. When, when you got five reps in, in a row, you got to stay fired up through all reps. Like it's not like you got a chance to really let go. But after each rep, you kind of got to reset for the next one, you know? So I, I see what yeah. you're saying. And I mean, doing snatches and cleans, I, I same approach. I mean, once you approach that bar – it's all shits and giggles. It's all shits and giggles and, 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 and jokes until you grab that bar. And that's at least how I approach it. Like, I try to have as much fun in the gym as possible. I try to be very just happy. Like, I joke around. I'm dancing. I like listening to my Hispanic music every now and then. My reggaeton, my salsa, my bachata. And I'm dancing at the gym. You know, we'll put some dubstep. I'm dancing to it. But when I grab that bar and I'm about to snatch, I'm about to clean like all that focus just goes into what you were saying, like setting the feet, setting the back, adjusting the position of the chest, really focusing on all those little mental cues that I have developed and through coaching as well, receiving coaching and giving coaching that I'm like, all right, this is what I need to do. My little checklist, this is what I need to do for this lift to be successful. And everything else just kind of zones out. Um, one of the biggest things that kind of affects me though, when I'm in that zone is when people walk in front of me and it's one of the little, one of the little pet peeves that I still struggle with as a high level athlete that's been doing this for 10 years. You know, when you work in and train in a gym that's somewhat commercial and you have high school kids and individuals walking in front because they have to go to their bar or their platform or whatever, you'll sometimes lose that focus. So that's what, that's what I struggle with, at least. Music-wise, I do know that 
I prefer a certain type of music because it gets me more happy and I'm able to relax and just be more chill. Um, I just don't like music. It irritates me. I don't like being in a bad mood at the gym, listening to music that I don't want to listen to. <laughs> and then having to also lift heavy shit in a bad mood because I don't like the music. Like if you like Katy Perry and you like uh, Selena Gomez and you just vibing and you're just having a good time, you're like, you know, the songs or whatever, then that's chill. But if you don't like the music and it's a negative stimulus that you're adding to your training, then that's a different approach. So I guess we're going through the rabbit hole of music and external stimulus, com comparing external stimulus to internal stimulus and some of the checklists that you apply to yourself, comparing the music to your internal awareness of your movement and your body before making a lift. Now, what I was asking you was your mental game and how you make your mental game stronger. So you're, you also mentioned that the music selection has a huge role to play in this. I still haven't figured it out. Oh, that's it. So when, when I got, so that, for instance, that workout was, I'm doing a rep every 40 seconds. So in order to get myself to come, you know, in order to relax during the other 36 seconds that I'm actually not lifting, I don't want external stimulus that is real loud and keeping me in that state Yeah. because I'm going to, I'm going to fail early. As soon as I'm done with the lift, I need to bring, I need to bring that down. Yeah. You know, I need to, I need to, I need to make that 36 seconds as relaxing as possible. So four seconds I'm lifting the other 36 seconds, I need to be as calm as I can. Yeah. I need to, I need to think about the lift. I need to, you know, the first thing I do when I let go of the bar is you you make your adjustments. Like here's where I felt on that rep. Maybe you didn't extend all the way. You have something that you maybe messed up, and you make that correction. Then you get ready for the next one. But in the 36 seconds in between, from the time you finish this lift to the next lift, you can't be in that super amped up state because you're you're wasting energy. You're you're you're, you're not going to have you're not going to have the energy there in the second half of it. If you're staying super amped and super pumped, it's as, it's even as simple as, um, you know, you can hold, you can hold a barbell overhead and yeah, for 30 seconds, it's not heavy. Five minutes, it's heavy. 10 minutes, it's heavy. So if I get done with that lift and I'm tense and I'm tight and I'm pacing around, and I'm, I'm stiff. Even those little things are taking energy away from you. So you want, you want your high to be higher where you're more fired up when you do the lift and you want your low to be lower. So listen to something that's real loud and in your face, you know, the other 36 seconds, you got to let yourself come down, totally relax, no stiffness in the body. Then when it's time to go, you're conserving that energy for the lift. So like if it's a, if it's a conditioning workout where let's say you're going to be moving the entire 10 minutes. Sure, you can listen to something loud that gets you going because you're kind of holding a steady, hard pace the whole way. Yeah. And it sucks. Something with contrast like weightlifting where the work is extremely intense and then you want to be as not intense as possible as soon as you're done, you don't want all, you don't want all that in between. Um, you, you'll notice it like if you go into competition, like you step up to the bar Everyone's staring at you. You're about to go. Your heart starts pounding. You gotta, you gotta be able to figure out how do I get myself into that state right away? Like, yeah. how can I turn that on as quickly as possible? And then how do I turn that off as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. So that's why I put on whatever music I like, whatever I enjoy that's going to keep me calm and relaxed. That's what I listen to. And I get fired up myself just for those four seconds. And then it's over. You were mentioning earlier that relying on external stimulus and you gave a couple of examples. One of them was kind of getting slapped by your training partner or, you know, your coach or something or um, getting yelled at by your teammates. Um, I don't remember the other example you gave like two or three, uh, but that gave me the curiosity 
as if you train alone? Like, do you do these workouts by yourself? Yeah, I do them all. I do them all alone. Do you have a training partner at all? No. My wife and my wife and I'll train occasionally. We'll do a short workout just to get the blood moving. Yeah. But uh, 95 plus percent of all the lifting I've ever done has been alone. Really? You did mention you had a training partner in powerlifting. Oh. Yeah, we, so, yeah, he, we would train. That was my first strongman competition. So that was the very first one. Uh, I was 20 years old. And so I knew that he had, did, he had done strongman. And we, he had the idea to put on a competition there in Corvallis, Oregon. Yeah. And so he had mentioned it, that he wants to host a competition. So I drove up, I drove with him up to Squim, Washington, up at the very top of almost at Canada. That was my first introduction to Strongman. The first time I ever done any of the movements. You know, went through the process of how to run a competition. And I probably trained with him a handful of times. And after that, I trained with another couple of guys on the weekends. But that's about the only training partners I've ever had. Okay. I had a buddy that I'd train maybe once a week with. But at a short period of time, I would train with some other guys. But most of it's been by myself. Yeah. And to go back to Chris, if you – so my first strongman competition, you know, I had spent – up to that point, I had spent my whole, my whole life thinking, like, hey, man, I want to be one of these strongman competitors. Like, these guys are jacked. They're explosive. They have great conditioning. So I actually ruptured my appendix, like, eight weeks out. Damn. So I had to spend a week on bed rest, and then I had seven weeks to get ready. You know, I went in, they had this tube that they took out of my stomach that was taking all the fluid out. And the surgeon's like, look, you, you know what you're doing in the gym. You don't really have any restrictions. And, you know, just play it by how you feel. Be smart about it. You're, you're on some antibiotics that might uh, lead to some tendon problems if you're really pushing it. And she's like, but, you know, you do uh, whatever feels good. She's like, I'm, you don't really have any restrictions. You're not going to get hurt. Just take it within reason. So I said, well, whatever, however I perform is how I'm going to perform. I'm not going to, I'm not going to back out. Yeah. Um, I signed up. So I went, I mean, I did okay. I did, I did a lot better than I did in training. You know, once you don't really realize how much better you are in competition compared to training until you try it. So I went and I got whooped by Chris. Mm. And, uh, and I expected to lose, but that night, you know, we're having a party over and his wife had to rub it in my face. Damn. Just, oh man, you sucked. Oh man, Chris whooped you. And so I remember being like, oh man, she just says, she just, she rubbed it in pretty good. <laughs> and I, I woke up, you know, I woke up the next day, hung over. I'm all beat up from the competition. Were you a good sport about yeah. it? Did you just laugh it out? Or are you like kind of I, in that moment? No, I was fine. Yeah. It's all it's all in so jokes. Woke, it's all it's all shits and giggles until you start really thinking about like, damn, that actually stung a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The the issue was until that point, you know, you you kind of go through different levels of like, yeah, you're the strong guy at the gym, or you're the strong like. So to lose and then have her rub it in, I'm like, oh, man, like, I got to make a decision. Am I really about this or not? Yeah. So I woke up and I was like, all right, it's time to get back in the gym. Yeah. Like, I, that was the decision. Like, hey, I'm about it. Like, I went in. I, I, I'm never going to perform worse than that, obviously, because um, I was still wasn't 100% recovered wise. And uh, I said, that's it. And so I, I trained. It was like, I just put my head down. It was like a year and a half to my next competition. Um, I had some work conflicts, so I couldn't, there was one I was supposed to do. But it was a year and a half of nonstop being like, oh, man, that sucked. Man, I hate losing. You know, all the time going into the gym, be like, God, I can't stand losing. 
So then a year and a half later, I went to go do my second strongman competition. Yeah. And it was a sweep. It was it was first place in all events. Ooh, congrats, my dude. And and I was like, oh that God. was probably like a long time ago, but still that was pretty sick. It's that nice. was it. So that was that was every day going into the gym being like, oh man, I got whooped. I can't believe I got whooped. And then so that's what motivated me for that like year and a half. Yeah. Like, oh man, I gotta I gotta redeem myself. <laughs> So that, that, that kind of has changed, but that was the that was the first time I'd ever really the first time I ever really lost like at that level. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I, you know, you you lose team, you know team games and stuff like that, but the first time that someone was like, "Oh man, I crushed that guy. The guy was a loser. He sucked." Damn. So that was. That was why I say Chris is my most important training partner because he was a stud. But he still is a stud. Yeah. Um, but that was him whooping me and his wife rubbing it in and then having to wake up the next day and make that, make that real decision. Like, are you going to be a strongman competitor or are you just, you know, kind of doing this for funsies? Yeah. And I was like, That's it. I'm going to come back and win. And what year was this? That was 2012. Okay. And you've been training Olympic weightlifting or dabbling with it in your training for the past that six was, years. So 2015, you started incorporating Olympic weightlifting movements? Or was it 16? Yeah, I, I had – it was 15. Okay. So I had done – I mean, I had done a little bit um, in CrossFit, but that's a small amount. Um, never any real – Never any real heavy sessions. Like I could do enough that I could do a power snatch or a power clean and do them at light weight. Yeah. But didn't really take it as in terms of the skill component of it up until that point would ha would mean I have to back off of strongman training. I don't have the time to, to really learn. So until I stopped doing strongman, I didn't re couldn't really – I couldn't really say I'm doing weightlifting because I didn't really dedicate any time to learning it. It was like, you learn the real basics just to do the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that was, then I started breaking down, watching tons of videos, figuring out how to do them. And then just tons of practice. And that's been six years of just tons of practice, tons of training. Yeah. So just on a day... Guide me, guide me through one of these days where you do just a massive twenty-minute Isabel with three thirty. What what does a day like that where you're just doing just a, a shit ton of reps at a shit ton of weight look for you? The session itself. So that was oh that day I had either personal training clients or a class. No, I think it was all personal training that day. 4.30, 5.30, at night. So I was like, well, I need to get this done by 4 o'clock. So I have enough time to, to clean up and be ready at 4.30. So that one, I, so I've got to start the workout at 3.40. Then I probably started warming up about 3.15. Yeah, kind of, I figured I was going to go for it. So I was kind of, I was dragging a little bit during the afternoon. Thinking, man, am I really going to, am I really going to try to try for this? So I probably started warming up about 3.15. Took about 25 minutes to warm up. What do you do for your warm-ups? Guide me through your warm-ups. Guide me through your warm-ups. Do you have My a warm specific warm-up that you do every single time you're going to train because of certain balances that you've had through your injuries like are you are you currently rehabbing shit still or do you just have like you know all right this is my workout today i know that it's going to be a lot of snatches like i'm going to focus specifically on my shoulders i know i need to work on my hip flexors like what is your approach is it day by day whatever the workout is i'm going to focus on that or do you have like specific things that you're prehabbing and reactivating to then do the other stuff. My warm up is usually I go, I start with the PVC pipe. I go through the fundamentals of the movement. Okay. So on this one, 
I'll start with a PVC muscle snatch. Do a bunch of muscle snatches, work on the overhead squat, get the, the basic, the basics of the movement down. This, the issue that I've had, I couldn't get this workout done before because my upper back is a little inflexible. So on this, the only specific thing I added was I do a thoracic spine stretch just to get the back to open up a little bit. So what would happen previously is that the upper back is a little stiff and I'm, I'm forward. So the shoulders have to work harder to stabilize the weight overhead. So I would fail because I can't stabilize overhead. Okay. But it's not the shoulders, it's the back not being in the right position when I get under the bar. So I knew I need to get the back a little bit more flexible. I got to I got to be able to get into a better extension position at the top of the back. Okay. So I did some I did some thoracic stretches to get moving. So that was the only thing specific I added. So I go through I do the muscle snatch, overhead squat, then I move on to a barbell, same thing. Bunch of muscle snatches, overhead squat. Uh, I just move the bar for, you know, two minutes. Then I'll add a little weight, usually uh, 75 or 95 pounds, and I'll do the same thing. The basics of the muscle snatch, overhead squat. Then I'll start doing some, like, hang power snatch, something to get my timing down. After that, that's probably, you know, 10 to 15 minutes usually. Most of that time is actual movement. Then I start, because I'm going to go heavy, I'll start at 135 and take 30-pound jumps. So I'll do 135, 165, 195, 195, 225. So that's about 225 is 100 kilos, and you mentioned three yeah. times before that. 30 pounds is about, mm, let's say, 12 kilos maybe 13 kilos. So you put, put the 15 pounds on each side, which is about 7.5 kilos, 7.2. So you add the 15, you add 15 pounds on each side every time. Right. So you're mm -hmm. taking about a 10 to 12 kilo jump for attempt. Yeah. Okay. Do All the way until I'm at three. Do you have that training from that day, the Isabel, the 3.30? Do you have the whole format of when you started and when you ended? Like the warm-up and then the bar. Warm-up to finish? Warm-up to finish. Do you have that? No, I can write it down. <laughs> no, I don't want it. I don't want it written down. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see you warming up from the bar until you're done with 3.30, the last attempt. At 1958, I want to. I like, do you have that video? No, I just no, I just started the clock. Mm. Well, then I think that I think that that'd be in some interesting footage to see, you know, because it's not it's not normal to see that many reps, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I, I need you to understand. I know that you have this method damn near perfect for yourself. I'm not saying it doesn't work for other people. I just don't know of a lot of people that do it. And it would be interesting to see. I mean, there's there's a lot of years of preparation that go into being able to pull off a workout like this. And it, it isn't just on your warm-up. It isn't just on how you're warming up, right? That isn't just what leads to a successful day like this. But it would be interesting to see. You know, on a day that you have a very high-intensity workout, the mental game of what you're bringing into the table right now, like you're telling me, is keeping the lows low, keeping the highs really high, but then there's a physical preparation that comes through that too. So what do you eat? You have a you have you have this workout. What do you what do you eat normally? Like in your breakfast? I normally do. Do you have do you have a certain diet that you follow? Always, you ate always the same way, or do you eat more on a day like this? You carb load, do you eat more fiber? Do you eat more protein? Do you drink pre workout? Right? Like, what is uh, what's it going in? Oh, uh, this uh, my normal day, I do five meals 
50 grams of protein each. Okay. Usually 50 to 60 grams of carbs. Some vegetables thrown in there. Um, the fat will be whatever is in the meat. So it's normally, I would say I, ha- I have like a base diet of about 3,000 calories a day. Okay. And I want those 3,000 calories to be super high quality stuff. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a little higher, but anywhere, but usually about 3,000. Beyond 3,000 is extra, extra kind of stuff. Whatever, whatever you're in the, whatever I'm in the mood for. It's like that might be cream in my coffee, that kind of stuff. Yeah. If I need to bring my weight down, I just get super strict about those 3,000 calories. Yeah. Like I'm not, no extra this, no extra that. Like I'm not going to be, you know, sometimes I'm a little heavy when I measure it out. I'm going to be like, no, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest about what the, what those foods are, cut out all the other junk. The body weight will come down. So I kind of have that as a base of like, this is, this will support good training and good health and then stuff on top of that, you know, that's the extra little bit of weight that I carry. Yeah. So if I'm like, yeah, you know what? I, I've been getting a little too out of hand that, uh, at, at night or, um, maybe we've had a few too many birthday parties and it's like, all right, I gotta, I gotta clean this stuff up. Like I'm going to get back to being stricter. Yeah. But I try to I try to keep it pretty reasonable. So it's three thousand, you know, real high quality calories. It probably ends up being between thirty five hundred to four thousand a day. Damn. So the extra five, <clears throat> the extra five hundred ish, it's just random stuff. Like that might be peanut butter at the end of the day. So the last meal I have, and this is from watching uh, Dmitry Klokov like ten years ago. Oh shit. The last meal every day is either cottage cheese or Greek yogurt. And then depending on where I need to bring my weight, I'll throw some jelly on top or like frozen fruit. Interesting. So like if I got to bring my weight down, I'll do that in a video. Yeah. I was like, I was like 20. So I was like, Oh, that's what he eats for at the end of the day. So I'm going to eat at the end of the day. Yeah. So I started doing it. It's it's been a habit for like 10 years. Yeah. So instead of having like casein protein powder or whatever, I only use cottage cheese. It's the same stuff. Yeah. Um, So for instance, that'll be the same every time. So if if I'm not, if I'm training a little harder and I'm not as concerned about my weight, that might be Greek yogurt, jelly, and then maybe I add some little peanut butter on there. Yeah. If I'm like, you know what, I got to, I got to bring my weight down a little bit, no peanut butter. And I'm going to switch to fruit. Yeah. So it might be Greek yogurt and a banana or something on top, but it's not going to be kind of the extra stuff. So I focus first on getting high quality stuff in. Then anything in terms of calories on top of that, it, it depends on where I need to bring my weight to. So like if I got to make, if, for strong man, if I got to make, if I got to bring my weight down to 231, it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be real strict until I know my weight is within where I can make it for a weight cut. Yeah. Then I'll be a little looser as long as it stays there. What do you normally eat for breakfast? Get, get just like Monday through Friday. Do you have a steak? Breakfast. Or- yeah. Breakfast right now. We do this egg spinach cheese and cottage cheese like bake okay so it creates this weird quiche so you take a giant bag of spinach cottage cheese eggs cheese mix it up bake it for like 45 minutes cut it into six pieces Mm -hmm. put that in a container there's breakfast yeah just warm it up boom so that yeah that gets me to 50 grams of protein the middle three meals will probably be um, some type of meat and rice, maybe meat and potatoes with vegetables on the side.
There we go. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not up to speed on my influencer game, so my phone overheated again. Oh, sorry about that. Did you change to the computer? No, I took. It was charging. Oh. So the battery overheats if you're charging and using it too much. Oh shit. Oh well. Do you have a computer? Yeah, I got a computer. Oh, well, next time. This will be. This will be fine if it's not charging. Yeah. Next time. Next time, because there will be a next time. You have a lot of knowledge, and I want to. I want to. I want to talk to you about later in the future. Have another mm -hmm. podcast, um, and talk more about other stuff other stuff that my brain's been lining up with some other ideas but i don't want to overwhelm this interview let's um let's talk about the 50 to 1 method uh thank you again for 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 talking about your nutrition and all that good stuff it's it's good to have a good understanding of what a high level athlete really goes through in terms of what they need to eat right this, yeah this, that that to me for me whenever i meet a high level athlete i want to know what they do to be successful and everything between mental game rest training methodology right their recovery game is it on point like what are they doing to recover our bodies get beat up every day so reactivation nutrition rest training all that it's super important to me so yeah thank you for your time on that and um, I kind of want to end the interview on the 50 to 1 method. Um, and if you want to go about that a little bit more and just, just explain the, the psychology of it. We've, we've dabbled with it a little bit. We've talked different aspects about it. Now you have the floor entirely for yourself to explain the 50 to 1 method. This is basically your method of training that you didn't mention you've been doing for a long time. It's what's giving you the results that you have right now. It, it is, for what I understand, your unique style. There might be other people doing it. We don't know yet. But for now, it's your unique style. So what makes this unique style of training so different? And would you recommend it to anybody else? Um, what, what do you think are the prerequisites for someone to even want to start a training like this? And what does it look like? If I wanted to do it, what would you, what would you, what would you say? And uh, so here you go. The 50 to one method is all about cutting out anything unnecessary. So we get hyper-focused about what is actually harder than what you're currently adapted to and how you are gonna progress week to week. So we're not thinking of improving like building bricks. We're thinking of what aspect of this workout exceeds my current abilities. So when we think of the 80-20 rule, you know, the 80-20 rule, you know, if you apply the 80-20 rule to the 20%, you have the 64 to four rule. And if you apply the 80-20 rule to that 4%, you have the 50 to 1 rule. So if you think the 80-20 rule is applicable to a situation, meaning 80% of your results are from 20% of what you do, you logically have to believe the 50 to 1 rule. So half your results are only going to be from about 1% of what you do. So in a workout, I want to pick that one little, that 1% that exceeds what I did last time, and I want to reverse engineer it. So in the case of that back squat, we were talking a little bit earlier, someone squatting 225 for 10. That's an estimated max of 300. Next week, we want to be at 301. So what set and rep scheme gets us to 301? I don't know that math off the top of my head, but I want to pick a set and rep scheme that's going to get me to 301. And then each week, I want to be 302, 303, 304. I want to take very small linear progression. I think the biggest problem with linear or pro progressing linearly is that the rate is too fast. We're trying to add five pounds a week. or We're trying to add a rep a week, which is really tough. Five pounds to improve your back squat five pounds in a week is 
monstrous gains. One pound a week sounds like a, to a beginner sounds like nothing. But when you say, hey, in four years, that's 200 pounds you're adding. You know, if you're a 300 pound squatter at 18 years old, you're going to be a 500 pound squatter at 22. You're going to be an animal. You just have to be consistent. So that is the premise of the 50 to one method. Picking up just the part that exceeds what you're currently able to do and reverse engineering how you're going to get there. So if week one, I do 225 for 10, week two, I'm going to pick a set and rep that's going to give me an estimated max of 301. That's harder than 225 for 10. If it gives you a higher projected one rep max, that's a more difficult set. I want to build backwards from there. So let's just, whatever the, whatever the set is, then I'm going to go and I'm going to say, okay, to perform that, what do I need to do before that? So if you're going to build up to a top working set of 245, let's say, you're probably going to do what, 225 before? And then 205, 185, 135, 95, warm up at the bar. Then I say, what do I need to do to be able to move with the bar? Well, I should probably do some air squats. Maybe I'll ride a bike for a little bit. So there's my whole workout. I'm going to get to the gym. I'm going to ride the bike easy for three minutes. I'm going to do some air squats, see how my body feels. Then I'm going to warm up with the bar, 95, 135, one whatever. Then I'm going to get to 245 for whatever number of reps. That gives me an estimated one rep max of 301. I've done enough to get stronger at that point. That's it. That's all the method is. So I view it as very similar to the way that RPE works. If anyone's familiar with the way that powerlifters use RPE. But this is an objective measurement. So to be able to compare a set of five reps versus a set of 10 reps, this gives you a way to say this set of five was harder than this set of 10. And if every single week I'm exceeding my abilities by a tiny amount, one pound, let's say, I'm going to continue to get stronger. So I view that like my minimum effective dose. I'm going to show up to the gym. I'm going to exceed my abilities by a tiny amount. That's the minimum I got to do to get stronger. Then I'm going to do as much stuff as whatever my goals are up until the point of my maximum recoverable volume. If I want to get better at weightlifting, I need to do snatches and cleans and jerks. If I want to get better at strongman, I need to practice strongman movements. If I want to get better at, if I want to get more jacked, I need to do bodybuilding style work. So the strength is seen as what is the least I have to do to get stronger, which is that right there. Build up to one top working set harder than it was last week. Then the rest of my volume that I can recover from is filled with whatever my goals are. Weight lifting, strongman, bodybuilding, conditioning, anything you want. And that's the basic premise of the method. Being hyper-specific about just the thing that is going to make me stronger and not getting caught up in all these other things and doing more and more and more and more and more. Because you hit a limit of being able to add extra work because you have obligations outside of training. If you have a family, you have kids, you got work, you got other things you got to do. You can't just train more, 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 more all the time. And what you're getting better at is doing more work. If your goal is to do heavier work, at some point, the weight's got to go up. So that's the purpose of the method. Understand if my goal is to be able to lift more weight, how am I going to progress to lift more weight? Um, and the 50 to one method, the reason it has been successful for me is that a lot of people in the strength world have accepted that you're not going to perform your best every single week at one after another, which is true to a point, 
but you shouldn't have these big giant fluctuations where one week I feel like a champion because I took last week off. The next week, my body's all run down. I can't do anything. So from week to week, let's say I do three, you know, 225 for 10 one week. Next week, I'm going to say I'm going to do 301. If I fail that set of 301, it forces me to own up to the fact that I'm not getting stronger. So if I come in, I do a, a, a set that gives me a one rep max of 300. Next week, I just didn't have it in me. It's only 290. Okay, I'm not getting stronger. I'm not stronger today than I was a week ago. And I got to look myself in the mirror and say, why is that? Maybe you had something going on. You're not fully recovered. You're kind of beat up. That's fair. But what are you going to change from this week to next week so that you can get it done? That's where I use it as a coaching method. So training becomes more of an iterative process. And along the way, you can develop all these other things, nutrition, sleep, stress management. Because when you, when you see your performance go down, you address it right away. So if this week I'm a 300-pound squatter, next week uh, yeah, I'm a 290 squatter, okay, something needs to happen. You need to sleep more. You need to take your mobility seriously. You need to drink more water. Did you eat before the workout? You know, are, what do you got going on that doesn't allow you to come in and perform? So that is where instead of doing a 12-week training cycle and hopefully hitting a new max, you know, 12 weeks from now, we change that evaluation period to one week. Monday, I back squat. Next Monday, I want to be stronger. And if I'm not, why did that not happen? So you have to, oh, well, that's part of the process. If you're really strong, you're not going to keep doing that every single week. If you're a beginner, you will. So over the first course of your two to three years, you just add a pound here, add a pound there. As you fail, you know, you go back a little bit and build back up. But when you're building back up, you've addressed one area of weakness that you're not good at. So let's say I go from 300, 301, I'm, I'm killing it. Yeah. Week after week, I'm getting stronger. Mm -hmm. I get to 315, wasn't there today. Okay, why? You know, you so, got to answer that question. So something, something that I have a little bit of confusion here. You apply mm -hmm. the 50 to 1 method in terms of strength gains to the strength movements. So Correct. the squat, the clean, the, the, the deadlift and the bench, like anything that you have to maintain consistent tension, contact, or, or, tension, right. load on the bar. Correct. So any movement that, that, that can be done that way is where you're applying this. So correct. With that being said, the Isabel, which you are moving the bar for 20 minutes, you know, like you said, two minutes, Two minutes to three minutes of actual work. The other 18 are just mm -hmm. chilling. Um, you don't consider that workout part of your 50 to 1 method? It's, it's part of it in terms of when I say, like, I want to do the strength movement so that I can say I did something that will get me stronger. Then if my goal is weightlifting, I do as much volume on weightlifting as to what I feel like I can come in and perform better in the future. So if I'm going to come in and let's say, let's say you do 10 reps at 80% or something. Weightlifting is a little different because it's not a real set like it is a back squat. So I do that more of just traditional type of, of programming. Like you can, tr you can track it with um, tonnage. You can track it with average intensity. So a lot of times I want that to improve. I either want I want to improve my tonnage with a high with the same or higher average intensity. When that gets too much to handle, I start back I start back at a lower tonnage and average intensity and build back up. So that's that's very much more by feel, and the reason that's by feel is because by the time I started weightlifting, I had already been training for ten plus years. So like when I go to the gym, I know what's hard enough. Like as you get stronger, you start to have to know like this was a hard enough training session to improve and this is too much. 
Like that Isabel workout, that's too much. Like I'm beat up. I'm not going to be able to improve on that. Like now I got to go back. I'm going to start off lighter with less reps and I'll build up. But that's more, that's very much more like concrete. You know, that's, that is, you know, I want the, I want the weights to go up. I want the reps to go up. That's very, very much more by feel. Um, I treat those, you know, the same way that I would treat going and playing around the golf. Like there's a, there's a higher technical aspect to it. And so those are, those are treated more like a, like skill practice. I don't tire out on the snatch the same way I tire out on the deadlift. Okay. So in the deadlift, like you do a max set of deadlifts, that's it. Like you pack it up and you go home for the day. Like you're too beat up. Snatches, they don't, they don't fatigue your nervous system the same way. Interesting. Not to say they're not extremely demanding, um, but they don't fatigue you the way like there's times that I would do like a moderate yoke session for strongman. So let's say you're doing like 600 pound yoke walks for strongman. Your nervous system is so fried. You basically clean your stuff up and take a nap. Like that's it. I can't do anything. I can't do anything else. In weightlifting, I'm not taxed the same way. So to me, I want to get as much of those reps as I can. More reps is more chance for practice to get better at them. So it's, it's really... I'm really tracking the fatiguing movements, like the squats, the deadlifts, the presses, those things. I get really focused in on, I need to manage this because my number one thing is managing fatigue. Like I need to make sure I'm not so beat up and so tired that I can't do effective snatches or clean and jerks. If I'm squatting, if I'm squatting to the point like that, I'm, my legs are totally crushed. Yeah. And I'm not failing lifts because my legs um, are strong enough to do more weight. Mm -hmm. Like those squats are taken away from my clean and jerk. Like I'm putting all my energy into building the squat, but the, my legs aren't why I'm failing the lift. So like I'm, you know, I'm improving in an area where now my legs are even stronger, but my clean and jerk didn't move because what I is, still what have. Your, what is your squat? What is your, what is your best squat? Six, something over six for like three reps. Do you have a one rep max? No. Never hit a, one, a true one rep max in the squat. So I think I've done 605 for a triple. Um, so yeah, I've, I've tripled over 600. It's like I'm not going to, I'm not going to. Kilos. Yeah. I'm not going to fail a lift because my legs aren't strong enough. So I need to manage the fatigue. If I'm squatting all the time, my clean and jerk training is going to suck. Yeah. My legs are all beat up. So my goal on, on using kind of that projected one rep max on a, on a major strength session is just to be able to say like, Hey, I did enough to get stronger. Now I need to practice the weightlifting movements as much as possible to get better at them. Yeah. have an idea of what I get up to and try to beat it next time. So that's the same, that's the same way I train for strongman. Like in strongman, um, you know, I would, I would do a movement and I would do with a barbell the minimum amount I need to do to get stronger. So like I would build up to a one top working set of deadlifts. Then I would train whatever deadlift movement is coming up in the competition. So, like, if you have an axle deadlift coming up, you need to train with the axle. You need yeah. it, to, it moves a little differently. Are you, doing, um, are you doing specifically weightlifting training right now, or are you doing a little bit of everything? Um, a little bit of everything. Yeah. So, I'll do, I'll do some of each. But it's basically, I, I, I'm only tracking the things that are really going to, to fatigue or failure and seeing that, like, hey, I came in, I did what I need to do to get stronger. The rest of this is going to be based on um, how much time I have, whatever whatever I enjoy doing. Yeah. So um, the day you did Isabel, 
mm -hmm. the 3.30 of Seville. Did you do anything else besides that that day, or that was it? No, that was it. That's it. Yeah. That's the only thing I'm doing. Um, so that's how, that's kind of how I incorporate the way I, the way I incorporate other sports into it is that by minimizing the time I actually spend, like trying to get stronger, that means I have more time to practice other skills. Yeah. So it's, it's applicable for weightlifting. Weightlifting is a little different, but like for someone in strongman or CrossFit, you have a lot of skills you got to learn. If you spend all your time, you know, trying to build up your lift, you're not going to do muscle ups or handstand walks or double unders or any of that other stuff. Yeah. Because you you don't have time. You you beat up you beat yourself up trying to get stronger. When that volume could have been achieved the same way through doing something else. So a lot of like a lot of people who play a sport, they get into the gym. They want to get in. They want to be effective and they want to go play the sport. Yeah. For strength athletes, we get in the gym and we don't keep track of like what's strength training and what's sport. And they're slightly different. Okay. So I use strongman as an example, just because it's a little, it's a little easier to understand. Like the barbell shoulder press is strength training. You're not going to see it in a competition. Mm -hmm. but it's a very standardized movement. Your movement will look exactly the same week to week. You can use it to build strength pressing overhead. The log press is a little different. I don't think the log press is as good for developing overall strength, but it's a good expression of strength. And it takes a little bit different muscles. So you need to practice that. Like you have to practice the log specifically to be good at it. So like if I'm, if I'm trying to train for the log, I'll come in, do my shoulder press workout. Then instead of doing like back down sets or doing a bunch of extra volume on other stuff, the rest of my volume comes in on the log. Yeah. So a workout like that would be, I'd build up to one top working set of shoulder press. Then I would get practice in with the log, you know, sets of five to eight. So instead of, instead of um, just working on the shoulder press, I'm getting the overall same amount of work done, but I'm breaking it down into two ways. One, I'm tracking the intensity on that shoulder press so I can kind of click the box. Hey, I did enough to get stronger. The rest of that volume, I'm building the specific muscles for the log press. I don't understand strongman as much because I haven't done it, <laughs> but I'm trying to follow through as best as I can and understand the comparison between the two sports. Mm -hmm. uh, it does sound hard. That is the only thing that I'm getting from it is like, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's it. I come from a background a little... where we did a lot of complexes and now we're kind of incorporating complexes. Um, I've never done more than a set of five on the snatch like a set of five on the snatch is a lot i've never done more than 10 on the squat um so the type of training that you're talking about and the type of stuff that you're doing for me it just seems unreasonably unreasonably unsafe and i it's very dangerous like the, the stuff that I see you doing for me is just very dangerous. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. And for you to be able to complete it and those last couple of reps that you posted on your, on your video on Instagram from the SFL and being able to complete that. And I was like, this guy's a freak of nature. I mean, regardless, regardless of how your training is, regardless of how perfect you've got down this method of training, you're a freak of nature. And that is facts. I mean, what you're doing and the way that you're doing it, I'm sure there's not a lot of people that can do it. So I'm sure that what you're doing also and the way the 50 to one method has a lot to do with it because it's what you've been doing. So I'll give you, I, let me give you an example of a, there's a teenager that um, he just started football this year. Yeah. And we had him, we had him come in 
uh, last summer when the pandemic first started. Yeah. And he had a, him and his older brother started training with us. So when he started out, this guy could barely, barely squat 95 pounds. And it was, it was not pretty. And he, he's the youngest of like six boys. And they all make fun of him for being the least athletic. Yeah. So in a year's time frame, I think he went from about a 95 pound just train wreck of a squat to a good, solid 245 pound back squat. Full depth, knees tracking perfectly, everything looked good. But it's not really the 150 pounds he put on his back squat that's important. What's important is that when you start off understanding that ideology, he's coming in each week. And, I, and for a long time, I'm like, man, this kid's going to quit. Yeah. Like, he ain't going to make it. Uh, he, he just is like, dra you know, dragging a little bit. But what happened is we went from, hey, coach, how many reps do I got to get today? I'm like, oh, well, you need to do seven. Or, hey, you need to do eight. Or, you need to do three. Eventually, over the course of like six months, you know, we hit the six-month mark and he's seeing the progress that he's made. Mm -hmm. There's a mental shift that happens where instead of me telling him, you know, hey, this is how many, this is what I need you to do today. He comes in fired up and he's looking at it and you can see that he has that drive to get those last reps. So instead of me saying, hey, I need you to get six today, he's coming to me and asking, hey, what do I need to do to get stronger? And then executing on it. And so the first six months were like, hey, I, I want you to get five reps. I want you to get 10. I want you to get this. It's me pushing him to do it. Then as he sees that progress, as he starts to internalize that idea of pushing his limits, he's saying, hey, coach, how many reps do I got to get? And then I show him, hey, this is, this, is how you, this is how you find that out. Here's how you calculate it. He's doing that on his own. And then now he's coming in and he's outworking everybody. Now he sees that path. He says, okay, I'm getting six reps. And he fights for every one of those reps and gets them done. So it's not the, it's not the extra strength that he's, that's going to benefit him. It's the mentality he has now of saying, hey, what do, I need to get, what do I need to do to get better? And having the self-belief to execute on it. And when we see athletes fail, you almost never see someone fail and give 100% effort. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you go for a lift and you take, as soon as the bar breaks from the ground in your head, you're like, that, that's heavy. I'm not going to make it. So you, when you watch failed reps, it's like 99% the athlete didn't give 100%. They quit on the lift before they, before they actually really went for it. It's very rare to see someone go, I'm giving, give 100% on that lift and fail it. It just doesn't happen. Only, only people at the very top, do you see, man, this guy's developed that skill to give it all. And so developing that ability right there to say, hey, believing in yourself and then executing and having the toughness to, to stick it out and get them done, that's going to serve him so much more than just being stronger. Because he leaves us, oh, cool. Yeah, he's, he's stronger and whatnot. But that's where it ends. You know, he's always going to be reliant on a coach pushing him and telling him to do something instead he's internalized it to say okay here's what i need to do and then he goes and gets it done so that's kind of when i said you know the exercise science takes second place to the psychology because getting that psychology down dude training's hard and to be the best you're gonna have to train harder and push yourself harder than everyone else and you're building that from the beginning versus kind of getting to those top levels and now have to learn, okay, how do I push myself harder than everyone else? So every, almost everything I do, it's, it's, not that, it's not that I don't care about the exercise science. It's that actually doing it sucks and it's hard. And it... it it comes down more to how do you convince yourself and get yourself to do it 
than what the perfect program is. There's a million great programs out there. Most of them get you stronger. But you still got to push yourself. And we don't, we don't see that aspect of it. We just say, hey, man, Michael Jordan's really motivated. But it's like he's motivated because he got whooped as a teenager. You know, and all of those failures are what push him to be who he is. It's the, and that psychology isn't, isn't incorporated enough. You know, that's, that's one of the, the reasons why I enjoy having these conversations with high-level athletes like yourself that obviously has, find, has, has found success doing things in a different way. And, um, you know, not only being able to share your story, what you're about, and, you know. Well, if someone, to- if someone told you previously, hey, I'm going to snatch, I'm going to snatch 150 kilos 30 times. It'd be like, no, that's stupid. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> You're not doing that. I still can't believe you did it. Like, I only saw the last three reps until I see the full video of Graciano. Oh, I the mean, full video is that? Where is it? It's on Instagram. Oh, you got to look at the IGTV. You got to look at the IGTV. I'm going to watch that later. I'm going to watch that later. It's going to be interesting to see. It's because you're po- you, you generate so much power from the ground to the power position, and it's consistent. On the last three videos of, on the last three snatches from that from that video that you posted, like the speed is just there. Like I would be dead. I would be dead. But it'll be it'll be. It'll be a good time if you ever decide to come to Cal Strength and train and uh, just just learn from you more in person and being able to, you know, you learn from us too. I think that would be cool. But what I was going at is is, is interesting. It's, 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 it's interesting to talk about the psychology of the sport because so much work goes into each individual's just body. We don't really think about everything that goes up here, right? And a lot of the things that you've said so far about pushing yourself, about removing external stimulus, about changing the music so you're not overly stimulated, not relying on other people, like all these things change a lot of what is being said, you know, in the community right now, right? We got to be there for each other. We got to build a team. We got to do this. We got to do that. And this is coming from a guy that trains by himself at his gym 95% of the time, listens to Katy Perry, and is snatching 150 uh, for 30 times in 20 minutes. So some people might say you're crazy. Um. I think I think that there is a lot of reason and between behind what you're saying. It makes sense. And I give you the benefit of the doubt, my dude. I think there's there's a there's some there's some genius behind your crazes. There's some genius behind your craziness. So um, I'm not I'm not gonna guarantee that if you come down a train, Cal Strength will listen to Selena Gomez and Katy Perry to meet your uh, stimulus needs. We might listen to some dubstep. You might just be overly stimulated. We might put some reggaeton. We might put some country, my dude. But it'll be a good time regardless. Thank you so much for sharing your 50 to 1 method with us. I think it's really, really cool that you approach training from such an in-depth psychological breakthrough method where you're literally challenging the individual 50 different ways to challenge one person to grow, right? Because, I mean, I know that there's a lot that goes into it, but if you think about it too, like there's just so much adversity that you're including into their training, so much adversity you're you're including into their psychological aspect, which is you need to grow. 
there is no time for comfort zones. So anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm looking forward to coming out to Cal Strength and training with you guys. That'd be sick. I'll be dude. up there. For sure. Um, do you want to share your social media, your gym, your location, kind of like any info where people can find you? Yeah, follow Instagram. My personal account's Wall Street Weightlifter. Uh, gym account's CrossFit Valley View, located in Las Banas, California. Nice. Why Wall Street Weightlifter? Oh, I also am an investment advisor. So I, I started working at Merrill Lynch four years ago. And I needed a I needed a catchier Instagram name. So I said, well, I need something better than, than just my personal name. So <laughs> I changed it to uh, Wall Street Weightlifter and then went independent and kept the name. Yeah. So that's it. Dave turn money into more money. Yeah, turn money into more turn money. Turn money into more money, chasing gains all day. I mean, that pretty much sums up Wall Street weightlifter right there. Dave actually worked in uh in in Wall Street when he was young too, so that might be a good topic of conversation for you guys to have at some point. Uh, he also worked in investment and in business and all that good stuff. I don't really know much because that's not just that's not something I talk to him about. I just know about it so. Um, thank you so much, Graciano, for your time. It was a pleasure meeting you. Hope to see you lifting weights. Uh, oh, also, last question. Um, what's your next plans? Will you have any competitions coming up? Anything that uh, the internet? No, I gotta, I gotta come up to. I gotta come up with a new challenge now. Oh, you gotta come up with a new challenge. I'll, I'll come up with a new challenge and then. I'll uh, brainstorm how to get it done. Yeah, well, the next challenge so far is coming to Cal Strength for a max out session. So that's that's the next thing people should be looking up, look forward to. Uh, bring a camera, record it, start a YouTube channel, put some stuff out there. I think you got a lot of positivity and a lot of energy to bring into the world, bro. I appreciate it. No problem, man. I'll be seeing you. Thank All right, you take so care, much. man.